Nobody likes being wrong, but why not? Uh, that's a question that Catherine Schultz asks in her book, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. She also explores what it means to be wrong in the first place and whether it's possible to embrace our penchant for error as an essential aspect of human nature. Ms. Schultz is a journalist who's written for The Nation, Rolling Stone, New York Times Magazine. Her book is published by Echo, and I'm very pleased that it brings her to our show today. Hello. Hello, my pleasure to be here. Your background is in journalism, but this book is very philosophical in style and in argument. What got you thinking about the positive aspects of wrongness? Well, you know, I think that I I didn't actually think start out thinking about wrongness. I started out thinking about rightness, funnily enough, and thinking about how much we all love the experience of being right and we're really attached to it and we get into all kinds of conflicts because we want to prove our rightness. And we feel real pleasure when it turns out we were right, that fact, we were right about that fact and the other person got it all wrong. Exactly, even when it's completely trivial. And I realized early on that a lot of that desire to be right stems from a real dread of being wrong even though, as you suggested, I do think that wrongness can also be something that is really pleasurable and important in our lives, and I wanted to try to explore and to some extent champion that fact. Do you think people give a lot of thought to what it means to be wrong? No. In fact, I think uh, for the most part we think about being wrong as little as possible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We generally don't enjoy thinking about our errors. We try to avoid it. And uh, again, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to try to encourage all of us to explore our own relationship to wrongness a little bit more. Well, do you think that people feel differently about their wrongness depending on whether the mistake is on a small or a huge scale? For sure. There's no question that the stakes and consequences of our errors obviously really affect how we respond to them. That said, it's kind of a strange thing about people that even with respect to our relatively trivial mistakes, we can get very heated and emotional and passionate about them. There's a, uh, I tell the story in, a bo- in the book, but uh, someone confessed to me that he managed to get uh, very, very worked up about how convinced he was that he was right about the number of carbohydrates in a jar of pickles. And truly, I can't fathom a more trivial thing to care about being right or wrong about. Politicians and pundits seem to find it very difficult to admit that they were wrong when the absence of weapons of mass destruction uh, are brought up to people who advocated and engineered going into war in Iraq. Uh, They don't apologize. Instead, they cite faulty intelligence reports, uh, putting the blame on others, uh, or they point out that Saddam Hussein was a terrible dictator and that it was important to bring more democracy to the Middle East, which is shifting justifications. Uh, But then they don't say, well, you know, uh, we were wrong, and maybe we shouldn't have done that. A lot of people have died. That's true. You know, uh, we have this sort of famous and famously horrible locution, locution, mistakes were made, which is actually such a great example of how we can't acknowledge our errors. I mean, in saying that, on the surface, it's sort of this dodgy effort to admit, yeah, something went wrong. But when you think about it, there's really no first-person act of responsibility in that sentiment. Another one is I misspoke, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, I, I, I said the wrong thing. I lied. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, you know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners just heard that with regard to the oil spill in the Gulf, uh, President Obama actually did say the words, I was wrong, and there was quite a reaction to it, partly because it's so rare to hear that from a leading politician. Rush Limbaugh argues that he wasn't wrong about the safety of offshore oil drilling, that the BP disaster was the work of sabotage by environmentalists who want to undermine his desire to see more drilling. Right. And this is a very classic example of the way that when we're really committed to a belief, no amount of counter evidence or virtually no amount of counter evidence will overturn it will always find some other explanation for why we really were right after all. How have philosophers defined wrongness over the years? Has this been a big issue for philosophers? Well, it's a huge issue for philosophers insofar as from its very origins, philosophy as a domain was concerned with truth. How do we get at truth? How do we know if something is true? And if you're really worried about whether something is true, you need to be equally worried about whether or not it's false. And so philosophers for a very long time have wondered about errors and why we make them, and and most of all, how we can identify them when we have made them. And Plato came up with a definition of wrongness that uh, has real problems. 
Well, in fact, most philosophical definitions of wrongness have real problems. The standard one is simply taking something as false that is, in fact, true or taking something as true that is, in fact, false. That is the platonic definition. The trouble with that... what's wrong with that? Well, in some ways, it's really useful. And certainly when we talk about wrongness in daily life, that is the definition that we usually have in mind. When I say you're wrong, I mean you have some idea about the world that is just completely at odds with reality. The problem is that in many, many situations, we don't really know that. You know, I can say that you're wrong about the existence of God, and you can say I'm wrong, and who's going to adjudicate? I mean, other than God, right? So there's many situations where that definition of wrongness doesn't really get us very far. And I'm always amused when people write angry letters to newspapers that the film critic was totally wrong uh, in uh, deciding that that film was a masterpiece, it was just the worst thing uh, he'd ever seen. Right. This is a really great example. Something that I love about human beings is that we are capable of believing that we are dead right about our own aesthetic judgments. And we do that even though we know that, of course, right and wrong as as benchmarks or standards don't really apply to matters of taste. And we all understand that in the abstract. But when we actually start arguing about, you know, was Avatar brilliant or terrible? Is cherry pie delicious or awful? We get as entrenched as we do about our, you know, sort of larger or factually based beliefs about the world. Well, the fact of the matter is Avatar was terrible. Uh, you know, I'm with you there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the definition of wrongness that you eventually came to? You know, uh, I spend some time trying to define wrongness in the book, which sounds like it could be a boring exercise, but it's actually a really interesting one because it helps us understand how we use that term in daily life. And I ultimately advocate for a somewhat flexible notion of wrongness on the theory that it's a lot more important to understand how we use it than to pin it down to one definition. But essentially, I rely on two. And one is the one that you just referenced, uh, which is kind of the standard notion that to be wrong is to depart from or deviate from the world as it really is. And the other, which is quite different, is the uh, experience of having a belief about the world and you yourself coming to reject that belief. So even if there's no one kind of standing outside in an objective position who could say, yes, you were wrong and now you're right, you have had this internal experience of having to let go of a belief. And that's very, very challenging. And I think uh, one of the reasons we all have such strong emotional reactions to being wrong. But it can also be satisfying. Ultimately, it makes us feel good about ourselves. Absolutely. It can be satisfying. It can be illuminating. It can be transformative. And I think that's one of the things we really lose sight of when we talk about wrongness, that Although we tend to dread it and avoid it, it's fundamentally the engine of, of so much of our learning and so much of our pleasure. Well, I uh, interviewed Robert McNamara uh, late in his life, and he, it seemed to be almost cathartic for him to say I was wrong. I think that's an interesting example, and I wish I'd been there for that interview, actually. McNamara, of course, recorded his own experience of coming to recognize that his position on Vietnam was a mistake in his book, In Retrospect. And it, to me, that's a really fascinating document because it's a very rare example of a situation where a extremely high-powered political leader admitted being wrong about a crucially important issue – and part of what's fascinating is that there's so much clamor for politicians to accept responsibility for their mistakes, and yet when they actually do, as McNamara had cause to witness, they can really be subjected to a lot of vitriol and anger. And I suspect uh, the same thing is going to happen with Barack Obama, despite the fact that we want all of our politicians to say, I was wrong on this. When they actually say it, they pay a price. I think that's right. And in part, I think it really calls on us to examine our own behavior in that situation. Because if other people around us are going to take the step to say that they were wrong, assuming that they're doing so sincerely and, and genuinely believe that they were wrong, it is incumbent on us not to default to our position, which is the sort of, ha, 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 I told you so, I was right all along, which really is not going to advance the conversation very far. 